Good morning for all of the, for all of those of uh, board members and managers that are logging in. Um, I have the pleasure of here being with Misha from M two E. Uh, we're going to give everyone just about a minute or two to to get settled in and get all the participants in before we get the webinar uh, started. In today's webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, concrete restoration as well as um, issues with uh, with seawalls. Uh, so we're very excited to get today's course uh, started. Uh, we'll get started in just about a minute. Uh, for those of you that are first time to one of our webinars, um, feel free to have uh, used a question and answers. Uh, we try to make this very free flowing where you can ask any questions or ask, uh, provide, um, I'm sorry, provide any questions that you may have um, with regards to restoration or with regards to seawall. Uh, both Misha and myself will do our best to answer all the questions, but we do want to make it uh, very interactive. So feel free to, to put in any questions that you may have. At the end of the webinar, we will provide the contact information for both uh, M2E as well as Affinity Management. Uh, so don't worry. If you're not able to take notes, uh, we will also be posting it on our YouTube page, uh, which will share that information at the end of the webinar. And we'll also e-blast it to all of you that are on the webinar today. Again, uh, welcome to the webinar. We're looking forward to, to getting this started. All right, great. So um, I, I like to be punctual in what I say and what I do. So uh, it, it's 11.02. Um, uh, again, I want to take have, a, have the pleasure of here being with uh, Misha, one of the president, the president, I should say, of, of M2E. So I'm going to give you a little here introduction. Uh, Misha's experience in engineering and construction spans for over 30 years. Uh, during that time, he has overseen uh, projects ranging from multi-purpose conference halls to luxury condominiums across three continents. As the president of M2E, he has led project management, owner representation, and quality control for various multi-million dollar residential and commercial projects. His hands-on approach to resolving construction issues include defective work or uh, defective work or components, delay analysis, and budget disputes. Uh, so with further ado, I wanted to introduce Misha. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much for having us. It is our pleasure to be at this uh... A webinar that the company is organizing, and we look forward to hopefully share some fruitful and um, useful information with the board members that are on the uh, webinar. Definitely. Um, as for myself, my name is Rafael Aquino. I am the CEO and co-founder of Affinity Management Services. Uh, we are a condominium associate, condominium and homeowner association management company uh, throughout the tri-county area. Uh, we're just uh, that right size, not too big, not too small just right in that medium sector where we're able to service, you know, those associations that are looking for a bit more of a boutique style uh, management, as well as being able to, to have the resources that you get for them larger players, um, but yet have a little bit more contact with the owner and, and get things done in, in a quicker pace. So enough about us. I think uh, most of the board members and the uh, managers that are on the call uh, are here to learn a little bit more about seawalls and, and concrete restoration. So uh, I know we're here guiding, walking into hurricane season. Uh, this year, things have changed now. Hurricane season is opening up on, on May 15th, making our lives as managers and engineers a little more challenging. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it, it would be great to start uh, with, with the seawall. So uh, Misha, if you kind of be, uh, give us kind of a high level and understanding uh, of the seawall, how, how the seawall works, uh, what are the components uh, that managers and board members alike should be concerned about or should be looking at. Um, if you can kind of give us from an engineering perspective uh, that information. Uh, I do have here a slide that you shared that you'd like to share and I'll go ahead and post it up so that our uh, listeners can see it and you can kind of go over it. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you, Rafael. No problem. Um, well, uh, a seawall is a wall that protects you from the sea. Uh, in essence, it is both a component that prevents the soil to wash into the sea and for the sea to come on uh, uh, on the other side of the wall. The wall typically has two essential components, which is the seawall panel. The seawall panel is either made out of concrete or sometime out of steel. And it is essentially the vertical component of the seawall. The seawall has a cap, which is typically done uh, out of concrete, which is 
wide enough that you can actually walk on it. And that seawall cap is uh, anchored back with a tie back rod to what is called a dead man, which is essentially a belt and suspender structural component that prevents the seawall to tilt if exposed to the pressure of an upcoming ocean or sea. The reason why I wanted to have this graph is because often we are asked, as Rafael uh, uh, said it, well, what should I do or how would I know that my seawall is not working well? The only thing that you can see from the top, so to speak, is to see whether your seawall cap is in good condition. So signs of rust that would come through the sea cap, through seawall cap, or uh, elements of what we call spalling, which is essentially where the concrete is separating from the structure itself, would be signs that the seawall cap is not in good condition. But what about the seawall panels? Well, if a seawall panel is not in good condition, as you can see from here, the earth or soil on the right-hand side of this, which is the brown surface that you see, would eventually wash into the sea. And that way, that would cause erosion on the right-hand side of the seawall. What does erosion mean? Erosion is where water takes away soil so that soil starts to collapse. So what you would see at the surface of the soil component would be essentially holes forming and, and voids forming. And you would go and say, what, what happened? Uh, where did the soil go? Well, the soil actually washed into the sea because the sea wall did not retain it properly. Um, we are often asked to go uh, on uh, waterfront properties where people see that there is significant amount of wash off directly on or around the seawall cap and they go, well, I have really no idea where this earth went and we just peek on the other side of the seawall cap and see that there is a tremendous amount of sediment on the other side of the seawall and essentially that's where it went. Why is that an issue? Because your other structural component, whether it is a home or it is a, a, a condominium, count on the seawall to act as a barrier between the soil on one side and the sea level on the other side. If you lose enough soil, let's say simple case, if it is a single home, if you lose enough soil on the side of a single home, you would essentially wash off the basis of where the foundation of that wall is done. In the case of a condominium, you would not lose the base uh, of your foundation, assuming that you're on piles, but you have, what you will have is voids that would represent issues from the standpoint of tripping hazard or lack of use of the space beyond the seawall cap. That's kind of a 10,000 feet overview, Raphael, and I didn't want to get too technical. That's why I get this overly simplified thing so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. No, no, no worries at all. I mean, we definitely don't want to lose our, our, our viewers. <laughs> um, so I, I, I want to exp express, uh, you know, and, and get your understanding of the importance of, of maintaining a seawall. I know the discussion yesterday that we were having prior to the webinar, we were chit-chatting about some of the, the challenges, uh, let's say from a management perspective, where the seawall is not something that owners, you know, see. It, it's not something that that they appreciate just because, again, most of the as you said, that bulkhead or, or that the, the seawall head, it, it, it's something that people just believe is just a slab of concrete. They don't understand how important um, the sheet metals that are there or the pilings that are there, the maintenance and inspection of them. I know um, in my own experience where we've taken on certain properties where you'll find different deficiencies, where you'll find that the soil, it's, it's either kind of like a, like a manhole where we're starting to sink in, where, where it's evident that you're having a, a seawall a sea issue. If you can kind of talk a little bit, Misha, about the importance and what are the tips that you recommend as an engineer, uh, what associations uh, should be doing, how often should they be, let's say, checking or inspecting their seawalls? And you mentioned about spalling, maybe uh, uh, go a little bit deeper as to like for those managers of what a spalling is so they, they can kind of open their eyes when they're inspecting the property. Uh, let me start with that. That's an easy one. 
concrete is held together with steel, which is called steel reinforcement. But concrete is not impervious. In other words, salt from the air and water eventually does get through concrete. And when that salty, humid component gets in contact with the steel, the steel rusts. And when steel rusts, steel expands, essentially pushing the concrete away from it. It starts with cracks, but if the cracks are not dealt with in time, cracks form on both sides of the steel and eventually the steel pushes away the concrete where the concrete separates from the steel that reinforces it. When that separation occurs, that's what spalling is. Okay. Now back to maintenance. Uh, uh, I know that 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 uh, uh, this is not a, a an aesthetic item or a sexy item that bores. It's not something that is um, used. I'm going to say uh, on a regular basis, so to speak, to spend money on on the renovation of a lobby or something that would provide better impact or more important impact. The only thing that I would like to say is, um, I, I always talk about buildings being essentially the same like human beings. Uh, exercise and have a good diet and then go for a long time without having to go for a major surgery. Or you can have an unhealthy diet, sit in a couch for all of your life. And by the time that you see that something is wrong with a coronary issue, a building is no different. In other words, uh, there is pr proper ways of maintaining somebody, keeping it in shape, so to speak. So what does that mean for a seawall? The sooner that you find that there is an issue, the less expensive the repair goes. If you have just a puncture or a small problem with the actual uh, sheet piling or, or, or pile cap, it can be a localized intervention that can prevent or at least slow down the further decay. But if you that you have multiple sinkholes on the side of your, your seawall, then there is no, I'm gonna call it cheap uh, 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 <laughs> solution to that problem because you are talking about excavating the, the, the building side of the seawall, essentially the repairing it or repairing it through a significant prevention. So, you know, the, the old announce of prevention uh, uh, applies to building components as well, mm -hmm. yep. even when they're not your favorite building component like a correct. zero. Correct, correct. No, excellent point. And, you know, I, 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 it's, I'm excited. We already have some questions and I want to kind of jump already into the questions because they relate directly with what, what you're talking about. I have a question here from Mark and Mark asked, what kind of protection should be used to keep salt marsh from introducing into the foundation of the condo building? Uh, uh, to in, uh, for introducing what? Yeah, it's I'm saying what kind, of, what kind of protection should be used to keep salt marsh, is what they put, from in, being introduced into the foundation of the condo building? Oh, I'm okay. sorry, I, I, it could be that my internet or your internet is, but the, it is coming kind of through an echo. So I apologize once again, if you could repeat the question. Sure, I'm sure. I, I'm going to go into another one here that I think it, it relates a little bit more to what we're talking about here, which is what is the average life of a seawall? I have a question here from Manuel Rodriguez. What is the average, uh, the average, the average life, life expectancy? Yes, of a seawall. The seawall should typically have a life expectancy of a building, but the life expectancy is a statistical value. In essential, and essentially that means it's the average of the average of the average. Uh, you can say that the life expectancy of a Versailles is 75 years, but it's here, what, another, you know, three, four, four, five hundred years later. Um, it's because it's right. being maintained at a completely different rate than, than, than a condominium. Uh, a statistical value of the life expectancy can force concrete, but that doesn't mean that that 55 years plus one day is going to crumble. Correct. It's just a statistical value. So uh, I, I, I always want people to be kind of um, cautious because that depends on the quality of the construction and 
whom did the, the seawall and how well did they did it? Because that would impact it too. Um, at the, my, while, while you can use a, a, a rule of thumb that it should essentially live up to its life expectancy, pick a number. Again, it's a statistical number, 35, 25, 45. Yeah. Uh, it would be important to know because you know that from, from our experience in 40 years of certifications, we have building where we've been properly, you have other buildings where we have to go through multi-million dollars renovations because nothing was done in the building for oh, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, in this case, being vigilant as to the first sign of, of, of stress and, and having, uh, let's say every five years, every 10 years, somebody take a look at it, both from the building side and from the wet side. Um, uh, today you have uh, structural engineers that are certified divers that would actually take it to look. And, and, and at that point, you can prevent it from being a much greater problem. Correct. No, you, you bring up a, an excellent point because it, it's like everything else in life. And I think that analogy that you use of, of comparing it to a human, it, it, it's, it's on point. Uh, because if you're not taking care of yourself, then how long can you expect that seawall to, to, to maintain itself? And there's so many impacts that, that are hitting you know, seawalls. You have hurricanes. Uh, is your seawall being used as a dock as well? So there's added pressure. Um, to that seawall by having that weight being pushed onto it or, or going back and forth, being bumped constantly when the tides are going up and down. I mean, these are kind of logical things for our boards and managers that you should have front of mind. Um, I, I know that, you know, being a board member is no easy task. Uh, no one wants to raise fees. Uh, no one wants to expend any money. You want to keep things status quo. Uh, but the reality is that running any business, there needs to be um, preventative items, uh, maintenance done. Um, as well as investments into the business. So, so it's very important for our board members and our managers that are listening um, that you're contacting your, your engineer and having that seawall checked uh, on a regular basis, whether it be a, a program that you're doing every five years or, or before or after a major storm. Um, you want to make sure that you have some kind of plan in place, have a chat with uh, either M2E or, or whoever your partner is, and, and let them put together a plan for you because we need to rely on our professionals. You know, a lot of times, uh, what, what, is, what are your thoughts as a manager on the seawall? You know, while we may be good at, at a lot of things, there's certain things that we're definitely not the experts at and we need to rely um, on our experts. Uh, I have here another excellent question and, and I know this may be an attorney response that it depends, but I have here a question of what's like an estimate uh, to repair a seawall? Um, Man Manuel again has a seawall that's about 126 linear feet they need some TLC. I'm sure it depends on a lot of things, but well, what's like, let's say a worst case scenario and kind of like a best case scenario to repair a seawall or, you know, if you can kind of give our audience an idea. Sure. Um, there is, unfortunately, there is no, there is no magic number. And the reason yeah. is, is it just the cap or is it the cap and the wall? If the wall is concrete, uh, if the wall is sheet piling, is it just a puncture or is it a structural failure? Um, so a little TLC is kind of very broad uh, uh, description. Um, th there, is no, there, is no, there is no substitution for the eye of an expert. So um, I'm not trying to deflect the, the question, but the yeah. difference of pricing is so dramatic that Correct. if I give worst case scenario and I scare Manuel, uh, <laughs> where, uh, 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 all, although he may only have a problem with a cap, or if I give him an uh, average of an average number and yet his wall is collapsing, both ways I'm going to end up being uh, looking like ignorant, which is why, the, you know, even a look-see from the outside, even going, not going on the wet side, would give us an idea of what it would be. So what yeah. I would recommend is for an engineer to get a look-see. At that point, he will know at least what is what we call the mode of failure. How bad is it or how okay. good is it? So at that point, you can say, this is the bracket that you may have uh, as far as repair costs. Okay. I have another question here from Bernard, which I think has to do maybe with the maintenance side of it. But how do you put, how do property owners protect against sinkholes on their property? And I would say yeah, we should relate it maybe to seawalls, but, but either way, if you can kind of uh, go into the, elaborate the, on a that. Sinkhole, a, a sinkhole for somebody who doesn't know, uh, so you have, you have, you have, 
uh, spontaneous sinkholes and there is nothing you can do to protect it because it's essentially part of uh, the substrate uh, uh, on which your property is built. Uh, you have underground water that erodes the substrate of where a certain structure is done. And when they erode enough on it, then you have a catastrophic uh, 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 failure of the soil by sinkholes forming. So those are just part of nature and there is nothing you can do for it. The sinkholes that we are talking about, which is sinkholes that are erosion uh, uh, caused as a result of seawall failure are preventable because if your seawall function as it should, then you shouldn't have them. Correct. So what do you do about it? Uh, if it is seawall related or controlled erosion related, there is something you can do. If it is just natural, if you if you are if you're in West Kendall and you get a sinkhole, you're, there is no seawall that will help you. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Total sense. I have a question, interesting question here from David. Uh, how about iguanas affecting seawalls? I have no idea. Yeah, I, I, have, I no have no idea. idea. <laughs> I, I, I believe that they burrow, but but there is no there is no material. I don't I don't I, I never heard of iguanas going into into concrete. Uh, it could be very, 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 very strong ones, uh, yeah. but but I I have not in my career seen any collapse or structural failure that were iguana caused. Excellent, great. We want to make sure we're getting the participation of all, all, all of our uh, yes. individuals. Uh, we have here from Riverbend. Uh, uh, why are major underwriters not insuring seawalls? Uh, Typically when insurance step away from something is because they can't control the risk. Correct. And, and, and I hate to go back to what we started uh, the discussion with is they don't want to insure something that they can't control the maintenance of. We're involved sometimes as experts in lawsuit where the, 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 the insurance company just insured a condominium for let's say $30 million only for the condominium to have major failure in during a hurricane and and that defeats kind of them asserting that it was just hanky dory for 30 million but at least that's something that they can see insurers appraisers don't have typically the knowledge to be able to define how bad your seawall is doing and they don't like to buy risk that they can't control correct yeah um, yeah, and it, it makes total sense uh, what you said, Misha. I mean, same thing goes with there's certain other items uh, that are not covered in insurances. And I think you just can't control it. You, you have the same thing with landscaping. While, the, while you're, they're two totally different things, you know, they can't control those. And, and that's probably why um, it's not covered. We see it in our associations that do have seawalls. You know, the, those seawalls uh, are, are not covered. So that goes to show the importance of maintenance, in my opinion. Um, because an ex as Misha may have not been able to drill down on a number, and we ourselves have seen a, a, a big range of what repairs can look like, I think the range really depends on, on the lack of maintenance is the way I see it. If you're regularly or, or every, if you have a plan in place of, of inspecting the seawall, uh, then you're going to find yourself in a much better position and that useful life uh, will hopefully be much longer than if just kind of ignoring it and, and I think Misha said it best, it's not that sexy, but you're paying attention to it. Uh, it's gonna make your life as, as a board member and a manager much easier and avoid having a major expense of having to repair it completely. Um, I have a great question here from Hugo, and, and I think this may have to do as well with, you know, what, what's impacting South Florida, which is, you know, sea level rise and so, far, so forth. Uh, Hugo has a question here that says, is there any requirement regarding the minimum concrete cap uh, let's say for Miami Dade, like the height of that concrete cap. I do I do not know of one that is a minimum. It needs to conform to what the FEMA requirements to control flooding. So depending depending on the area that where you are with, it is part of the design procedure to to design that cap okay. because different different areas have different uh, 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 different approach to it, and it will be part of the design criteria when somebody designs your seawall. Correct. Yeah, makes to make, makes total sense. Um, so why don't we switch gears here again? Uh, kind of going on halfway of the webinar. I want to switch gears into into the restoration side of things. Um, there was, you know, there was, one, there was just one question from Manuel that I saw sure. when he said, "How long the seawall should be? How long every? How long? Or I guess what what are the the what are the 
uh, uh, frequency that you need to have getting inspected by a professional contractor, I would just like to, to say not a professional contractor. It should be a professional engineer. Engineer, yeah. Because if you get the contractor to take a look at it, he will find something wrong. Because <laughs> he doesn't make money from the inspection. He makes money from the repair. Whereas an engineer really doesn't care whether you repair it or not. He wants to tell you the truth and he'll tell you the truth, whether it's good or it's bad. So my recommendation would be whenever you have your repaint job, which is five to seven years, take a look at it. Uh, uh, that looks is not that expensive and it will give you peace of mind. Excellent. And you know what? That's, that's a great question to segue um, into the restoration side of things. Um, so, you know, we've seen boards where they're trying to do things on their own and, and there's a restoration project and they're contacting a contractor uh, to give them a proposal or, or give them an idea of where the building stands. If you'd be so kind to, to walk us through what your recommendation is for managers and boards that see some spalling, again, spalling is where you're seeing that rust and, and the concrete separating itself. Um, or, or you're walking into a 40, 50, or 60 year restoration if you're in Miami Dade or Broward County. Kind of give uh, our managers and our board members what's your recommendation when you're walking into a restoration project? Should you contact the contractor? Who should you contact? And what are the steps that should be taken? Uh, our recommendation is for, for, for you to first select an engineering firm. And, and I know it sounds redundant because I own an engineering firm. But, 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 but we're also a forensic engineering consultant, and essentially that means that we're the emergency room of construction, and we are called when some things go awfully bad. So from my now 40 plus years of experience in this business, I can tell you, it doesn't have to be my firm, but get a good engineer. And a good engineer is not always, is never the cheapest one. How about that? Yeah. So... Uh, I'll get to why that is the way it is, but why first the engineer and not the contractor? The engineer is a licensed professional, and as such, we are licensed because of our ability to hurt the, the, the public if we don't act in a professional manner, right? You are licensed, Rafael. We are licensed. Attorneys are licensed because we are interacting with the public, and our services are likely to hurt the public if they're not performed in a professional manner. So you should hire a professional engineer with experience in this type of work because he should give you a unbiased opinion of where you stand. Um, do not attempt to do this on your own. I'm currently involved in, in, in a condominium who is at the third board who after two attempts to do it by themselves essentially spend the money that they raised in the special assessment. And after spending all of it, they are 60% complete and they don't know what went wrong. Wow. Um, so the reason why the engineer is because the engineer by the profession that we practice is unbiased. Uh, we will tell you the truth, whether it is a good truth for you or a bad truth, but it will be the truth. And at that point, you can intelligently plan how you're gonna tackle it. So when we talk about spalling, or if you talk about certifications, uh, Raphael, we recommend not to wait until 40 years for your 40 years of certification, or not 50 years for your 51, because if there is something that needs to be done, you are against the clock, because depending on the municipality that you're in, you can actually be fined for not uh, filing your 40 years of research in time. We recommend that between three to five years before those, you hire an engineer who will have a proper conditional assessment of the entire community and give you what he believes or she believes is wrong and what the estimate is that the repair would cost. That will give you ample time to either raise funds, to budget properly and to start in time and to also have an opportunity to bid competitively that to contractors who will then know exactly what they need to do and which will not expose you to future change orders because the proper the, the actual work will be properly scoped and controlled. Correct. There is yeah, even, you know, so that's kind of the, the main thing, the first thing that you should do. Correct. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's the, the practice that we follow here. 
And, and again, I want to stress what, what Misha said, Wh whoever you decide to go with, um, you should be going through the same process that you're going with any, anyone else, you know, reaching out to one or two engineers. Um, or keep in mind, in, in our industry, a lot of times, you know, they, they believe you have to have five, six, seven, whatever the decision is that you and your board make, we are professionals, uh, but you should be dealing with a professional because you will see a big range, um, especially with, with engineering firms, but you want to make sure you're working with a strong, reputable firm that, that has a strong presence in the market, um, such as M2E, and that way you can get proper guidance because many times uh, in our experience where we've taken on certain properties, uh, we have seen exactly what Misha has seen where we, they went with someone that was the lowest bidder and, and all of a sudden you're having change orders left and right. That means more uh, engineering inspe inspections, more cost, and, and it's, a, it's a big challenge for associations and managers alike to have to manage situations such as that. Um, so with the restoration, why don't we start with something basic? Let's say uh, they have their building, right? You're, you're going into, maybe not into a 40 year, we can touch on that a little bit later, but I know one of the things that we recommend to, to our board members when we're on a new site, or even if we're managing the current property, is we believe that, that the paint is very important and it's kind of the skin uh, and what protects the buildings. From an engineering perspective, can you give you know, our audience an understanding of the importance of the paint? Um, what are the impacts in, in the choices that they're making and the type of paint uh, that they select for the building? Uh, if you can kind of go into that, I see that smile. I, I, I'm excited to hear your answer there. <laughs> well, um, uh, again, I'm, I'm, uh, whenever, whenever I do these webinars, I'm trying to make it as, 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 as less technical as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the simple answer is the quality of paint, the single factor that defines the quality of a paint is its ability, its thickness to be applied in one single application. In other words, if you apply paint number one and it is this much thick and you apply paint number two and it is twice as thick, then paint number two is twice better than paint number one. Why? Paint gets eaten up between uh, UV from uh, uh, the sun the particle of salt that are carried in the air because we live in South Florida and the water that washes it away, any paint eventually gets eaten up. The more that the weather has to eat through, the better the paint. So we often brought and, and, and they say, listen, uh, we have in our condo docks that we should repaint every five to seven years or something like that. However, the paint failed two years later or three years later. Um, the, the answer to that question is, did you buy a five-year paint? Because not every paint is a five-year paint. And uh, the more, the cheaper the contractor, the, bet, the better the, the probability that he will dilute some of that paint as he applies it, make it then a two and a half year paint. Um, in other words, there is no free lunch. So- right. What we do as engineers is we control not only what product is applied, but how it's applied over the building. We check the millage of the application to be sure that not only what we specify is applied, but the way that it's supposed to be applied. Um, your building skin, which is what, what we call the envelope or the skin of the building is comprised of three elements. The structure element, which is typically either concrete block or poured concrete, then the stucco on it, and then the paint over it. That together forms the envelope. So substrate plus stucco plus paint equals envelope. That's the skin of your building. And it's no different than your own skin, back to the analogy to human, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you treat your skin well, and uh, uh, then, then it will not break up and get easily scratched or, or hurt. In the case of, of, of the building, the application and quality of the stucco and the paint are important because first you have the substrate. So if the concrete is properly poured or does not have any cracks that are telegraphing through the stucco, then you're good. Then the stucco protects the concrete and the, and the uh, um, um, concrete block, but the stucco is porous too. Correct. So the paint is really your only waterproofing element 
Mm -hmm. And what stucco does is, in case that paint is breached, it will slow the progress of water in reaching the structural element. But each of those components has its role uh, within the com uh, env envelope of the building. Correct, and and that that goes to show the the importance, right, of something as simple as paint, uh, of what it has. Uh, I have a question here from Russell that he asked: How many layers of paint can one have before you need to strip the paint off? Uh, down to the concrete? Uh, it depends on the quality of the paint. Uh, your building is typically pressure washed before it gets painted. Correct. And the reason is, if there is loose paint, nobody is going to scrape down to concrete if there is paint that is adhering that you need to take a, a, a hammer to, to remove it. But that's why you do typically a cleaning or pressure cleaning of the building that, that, that is about to be painted to verify the quality and the adherence of the previous uh, 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 coat of paint. Correct. What you will find though is uh, you're almost thinking about the coat of paint that is almost like an elastomeric, like a rubbery. But what we see often is that the paint is chalky. So if, if you put your hands on your paint and your hand ends up being full like of talcum powder, your paint is shot. There is yeah. no more <laughs> paint no more. So it, it's, Misha, it's funny you said that because uh, sometimes when we go uh, a bit on properties, um, my, my business development manager or myself will put my hand on, on the thing and I go, uh, uh, it's time to uh, paint your building. You're way past it. <laughs> yeah. so, so I started with the paint. I, actually, you know what? Let's answer Julia's question here is how long um, should we expect paint to last? And then we'll, we'll go into the next thing. Uh, properly specified and applied paint should last around five years facing the water or indirect uh, 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 waterfront exposure or semi-direct. So if you're on Miami Beach, you're, you're, you're that or Correct. close to the bay or close enough to the bay. Uh, if you go further west, you should rise around seven years. Properly Correct. specified and properly applied paint. Correct. And also, also keep in mind, um, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I do have an engineering background. So, so I understand the, the concepts that Misha is speaking about. Also, you have to understand the pigmentation, you know, what, what color you're painting that, that does change as well. The impact that the sun has to the, to the type of paint. So as a board, you don't have the right to just change colors outright. You do have to take a vote. Uh, I should say you should review your documents first, speak to an attorney or professional there, but Either way, most likely any changes uh, you will, uh, it will require some, um, some kind of vote in order to do so. Um, so let's go into the associations, which, you know, in some cases, it may be most that, that don't paint the building uh, with the frequency that they should. Um, they find themselves in a different position where you're getting spalling, uh, where you're getting damages. Uh, what, are, what are the steps that um, an association, a board or management should take? Um, in order to start getting bids uh, because they're seeing cracking, they're seeing um, the stucco kind of, uh, uh, you're seeing gator cracks throughout the stucco, you're seeing issues. Uh, what's the normal protocol you would recommend for a manager and a board to take? You need to have a, a representative sample of the actual condition of the building because we saw this swing both ways. We were actually hired in a condominium in Key Biscayne where, where the previous engineer was estimating that the cost of the uh, concrete reno was going to be uh, $2 million. And it, there was not a lot of units, but what we recommended to the board is to actually allow us to inspect uh, enough units to get what we call the statistically significant sample. And at the end, they actually ask us to inspect all uh, the balconies. What happened is that the previous engineer looked at the balconies that the people complaining the most about spalling was, which were the three or five worst case scenario, yeah. And they projected that worst case scenario to the entire building, resulting in a $2 million. Wow. Once we did the actual uh, 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 observation that we did, which was, in, and we got paid to, uh, I'll give you just the, the, the actual values because I know them by heart. It was like $23,000, $24,000 to do the inspection for all of the balconies. It was not a big building. Um, but we found out that the actual cost is going to be $1.2 million. Because, wow. because you spend $20,000 mm -hmm. to, to save a million dollar, right? Correct. Um, and we finished on time and on budget. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, we try our best to, to, to go to push our boards to do those kinds of inspections. Um, like you said, look at that difference. You're talking about an $800,000, $20,000 investment to save yourself $780,000, $770,000, yeah. you know, um, because 
again, this is the difference uh, with the partners that you get, especially on, on the engineering side. And, and it's not just because Misha is here with me. It, it, it's just the, the sheer reality of, of the situation. When you're dealing with concrete restoration and, and whatever had occurred, the past is the past. You know, we, we need to move forward. We need to repair the building, uh, do what your fiduciary duty as a board and a manager is, which is get the building whole. Um, the right thing to do is not just do a regular basic inspection. Um, because at the end of the day, if you have a, a taller building, what the engineers are going to be doing are scoping it with, with binoculars or high tech firms like M2E will use drones. But at the end of the day, you're not getting a, a real analysis of what's going on. Sometimes, you know, you get the bill from the engineer and they're, oh, well, I'm not going to spend that. But you're looking at things short sighted. Once the, you know, there's no way you can beat the engineer up if you, they start to tap and start taking stucco off and they see more rebar that's damaged. There was no way they were able to see that when they were standing on the floor and that was on the 14th floor. So, you know, there's things you can do inspecting all the balconies, um, maybe having them install swing stages so they can do their inspections prehand and really get very close to what the repairs are going to look like. And that's going to save you thousands, if not millions of dollars, depending on the size of your property um, by doing that properly. Um, I, I, I think that I think for board members, they need, they need some, clarity, some clarity about what the business proposition of, of engineering firms is. Um, uh, there is different business models. Our is, because of the reputation and, and, and girth that we have, we, we, we don't have the luxury of, of having, uh, I'm gonna call it bad press if you wanna call it that way. Um, but you can, you can very well go and say, listen, uh, board members, I'll go and I'll take a look-see at your building for pick a number, two, three, five, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And I'll use binoculars to use your analogy. But, and based on my binoculars, I think that you have a pick a number, a million dollar problem. The work starts. And more importantly, you just assessed your, your, your condominium for a million dollar worth of work, right? And the, the contractor is selected and the work starts and you burn through the million so quickly and you didn't even finish 30, 40% of the building. What are your options? <laughs> your option is to stop in a half stripped, half demolished building, which the engineer who gave you the low ball knew when he started, which the contractor who scoped it based on his low ball knew because now what you're gonna do? Change contractors and engineers? No, right. you're gonna go back to your membership and assess them. And by the time that you tabulate this at the end of the project, you'll find out that he gonna, he's gonna cost you the same amount that the other engineer who told you the truth at the beginning told you. And at the same time, instead of having to go twice to assess or three times in some cases your association, you would have known the real number at the beginning. Correct. That's the difference. Correct. There is no free lunch. You yeah. will not get $3 million worth of work for $2 million. You Correct. will not get $3,000 worth of engineering work for $2,000. And if you believe you will, then you will find yourself in the very position that uh, Rafael and I uh, described. Correct, correct. It's better to pay now than to have to pay later with interest and everything else. That, that it comes with. I know uh, taking a more proactive approach and, 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 and taking that kind of approach, you have much more success. It's, it's easier to, to bear that news once, deal with it and stay within the project guidelines or the project timelines, um, then have to deal with that later. Uh, you're dealing with it two, three, as you said, even in some cases, uh, uh, four times. So, so, you know, as a board, it, it is your fiduciary duty and as a manager to, to do what's right for the condominium itself. And Sometimes it comes with, uh, with difficult decisions, but as a leader of the community, you know, uh, you're there to make the difficult um, choices and the right choices for, for your community. Um, I have a question here from Jeff, which is, is uh, kind of going back a little bit into the paint. Is there like a better paint um, that works better in cooler temperatures, summer, hot, humid conditions, and so forth? No, they're just good paint and bad paint. Yeah, and bad paint, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, you, can, you can have, you know, the BASF's paint, on, on the top of that, uh, all the way to different uh, different components. But essentially, uh, 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 engineers know, and engineers will give you uh, a choice, 
with, if he is honest, an actual life expectancy of the pain. So this is yeah. a five-year pain, this is a three-year pain, this is a seven-year pain, what do you want? Correct. So, so let's go into the stage of the project itself. So we, we, we hired a, an engineering firm or M2E to do our, our inspections. They scope it out. They help us put together the RFP. Um, we bid this project out. We select the contractor. Um, what are the steps that a, a good engineering firm is going to follow uh, once the contractor has been selected? Because I know it just doesn't end there. If you can kind of give what are your professional recommendations of the next step? Because now the contractor comes on site. Uh, wh what do you recommend from, from an engineering perspective? I think it segues, uh, Ali Wood uh, uh, from Central Florida uh, has a question about engineers in a very close relationship with, co with concrete companies. Which is a great question. Mm -hmm. wink, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, first, first, let me tell Ali that there is an M2E office in Orlando. So, so uh, I can tell you that that office is no, in no connection with Concrete Concrete Club because um, it would be a violation of our, of our professional oath uh, and code of ethics. Um, and uh, the, the best way would be to have an engineer who would give you um, so two to three contractors and an opinion, not whom to choose, but what are the components of the bids of those contractors. So the selection of the contractor, the way that we do it, is we have a walkthrough with, with a select number of, of qualified contractors. And let's say there is five of them. We just draw a line, let's say past the first three, and we explain why we don't recommend number four and five. And it is the business decision of the board to choose any of the one to threes and we will explain to them the experience, good and bad, that we had in each of them in previous projects. There is no substitution for mileage. Uh, this, this, there is not that many contractors who do the type of, this type of work. And if you talk to a reputable engineering company, they dealt with them before. Correct. So one of the questions to ask your engineer is, did you deal with this contractor before? Mm -hmm but also ask him, did you deal with that other contractor before and that other contractor? Because if the only contractor or predominant contractor that that engineer has selected over the years is contractor X, then there might be a feeling of, of foul play uh, uh, as to what was uh, actually going on. Because yes, we know all of the horror story of the kickbacks. Uh, whether it's a kickback to, a, to an engineer or a kickback to a board member, those, those horror stories exist in our business, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I'm proud to say that we were not, not ever even remotely uh, uh, accused of, of uh, uh, such a, uh, a behavior because, as I said, because of our reputation and, and space, you know, space we occupy in the marketplace, we can't, we can't really afford it. So um, choice of contractors and... Um, I have to tell you the bad news that in today's environment, everybody's incredibly busy. So one that pushed the prices up because qualified personnel is difficult to find on the contractor side. And also the time that they will be able to start is being pushed because of the ability of manpower. That being said, there is still capable contractors. Mm -hmm. There is no perfect contractor, there, like there is no perfect engineer. And it boils down to how it is controlled. That's a very long-winded beginning of an answer to your question, Rafael. Uh, I don't know what other engineers do. I can tell you what we do. <clears throat> How do you control your contractor is by being essentially present in the site and showing him that you have independent records of the, the amount and quality of work that is performed. Our engineers are on the swing stage with the contractor the first time when they go and they map the area to be treated, let's say separating stucco, spalling, sp spray paint the area. And right there on the stage, we agree on what that surface is. Three square feet, five square feet, uh, four linear feet of concrete, uh, two linear feet of rebar, whatever it is. Once he starts removing that, we go a second time on the swing stage. And we confirmed that he removed only what we told him to remove. What happened at that point sometimes is that it covers other things that we couldn't see until that was removed. 
So then we modify and we say, okay, this is not four, this is really six feet, because when you start knocking on the on the stucco, another chunk develops. Mm -hmm. Then he does his repair. We are now a third time, and we confirm the as-built condition that he did not repair anything that was not previously mapped. He signs that document, the contractor. So when the requisition for payment comes for the stucco part and demo part, there is no unknown. We know exactly every square foot and every linear foot of material that was removed and put back on the building. And we go a fourth time when the paint is applied to be sure that it's properly applied. And until we are satisfied with the quality so that you don't look at the zebra, but the building, you, uh, they don't get approval. And sometimes we're, we go back to be sure that it's done the, the, the right way. So there is no surprises. Essentially, we know at the end of every drop, we make the sum of all of this square footage of stucco, of all the linear footage of, of, of spalling, of everything that needs to be done. Those should be reflected in the requisition for payment and not a foot more, not an inch more, not a pound more. Correct. Good point, uh, Misha. I mean, it, it, it's so important to, to have, you know, that that third party or, or independent party, I guess I should say, uh, doing that. Again, um, you know, coming from the management side, uh, you know, we, we, we get pushed a lot and, and we understand we're, we're managing nonprofits, right? There's not excess cash flow. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's really not um, our responsibility. We, we need to count on, on our, our project managers, on our engineers to supervise that work because, again, it, we're not experts of, of what's the right way of, of cleaning out that, that rebar and then reapplying what's the chemicals that need to reapply to that rebar for, for the stucco to stick or, or whatever the application may be. Um, so, so it's very important because if you don't have that supervision, uh, look at it this way. Uh, how do we know if the contractor did 700 square feet compared to 70 square feet? Um, it, it's almost impossible. And also when it comes to signing off uh, of the checks, because each party uh, the engineer signing off, the contractor signing off. Uh, we also have uh, in the case where the engineer signs off, letting us know, listen, you're good to go to make this next 15% payment. Um, so they'll sign depending on, on what gets decided earlier on in the project. If it's A1As, whatever it may be, they'll, they'll, the engineer will be signing off on that, giving that confidence to the board and the manager to go ahead and release payment because X percentage of the project uh, has been done. Uh, we have a question here for, for Mendoza, which is, uh, what, what do we do if, if the board makes stupid decisions? Um, <laughs> and and there's the, the reality of it is that your choice as, as a board member, or it sounds like you're not a board member, but a member is really to, if you believe that the board is making uh, the incorrect decision, let's say it that way, uh, then your option is really to either get them off the board and get individuals that are a little bit more competent. Um, I'm sure, Misha, I, I know I would say that we've had to deal with that many times. Uh, we don't take it personal because it's part of the business. We have to handle ourselves in a professional manner. Uh, but ultimately, as Misha has said multiple times, and I'll say again, uh, you know, we don't make the decisions. We work on your behalf. We're going to tell you what we recommend. And we're going to tell you what's the right thing. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the board is the one that, that's driving uh, your organization. So from a management perspective, that's the importance of making sure that you're paying attention uh, during the, the election process. So uh, Misha, we're getting close to our time, but I do wanna kind of go a, a little bit deeper into that, that project. So we've already spoken about hiring the, the engineer to, to get the RFP done. Uh, we've spoken about uh, getting the engineer with the contractor to supervise the project. Now let's say when we're wrapping up the project, is there anything that our boards and management should be keeping uh, front of mind uh, when we're wrapping up the project and, and like, let's talk a little bit maybe about warranties and, and, and how do those warranties apply? If you can kind of give them a, a little bit high level, I know you can't go into much detail yeah. because it depends, uh, but if you can well, kind of give that in the wrap up. Uh, you need to be sure, well, what we call this process is the closeout of the project. So there is, there will be representations of warranties from the contractor and from the manufacturer of your paint. You need to be sure to get those in writing. And you need to be sure that, for example, uh, tricks of the trade. A paint will give you a certain warranty if it's been applied by what they call an approved applicator. In other words, your contractor has to be trained and approved by that brand 
to apply their paint. Be sure that that's the case. That's something that engineers always verify, but be sure that that, that representation is clear so that there is no discussion if it is a material failure of the paint that the paint manufacturer will come to the table. Uh, be sure that during the actual course of the project, the rep for the paint manufacturer is also present at the site and blesses not only the applicator, but the way that the thing is applied so that you have an understanding that there is a clear no way out for the paint manufacturer to uh, get out of his warranty obligations. As far as the contractor, the best recommendation I can have is be sure that he exists for more than two or three or five years. Uh, talk, to, talk to whomever they did business before with, specifically boards, uh, because you want to be sure that if there is a call for a warranty call that, that you don't have a, a busy signal at the end of the uh, phone because he just went out of business. Uh, concrete restoration and paint is actually uh, 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 could, could be a thriving business and a lot of people have in it. Uh, we have to that being exposed to most of the players in the game. So we know that depending on what their attitude going into a project is, what is the proper way to manage them. But be sure to check references and be sure to um, that they still have their license in, in, in full effect and all that good stuff that you would have. If you take all of that, your, your engineer at the closeups will essentially give you back both uh, a proof that the contractor who applied the paint was an approved applicator, that the it was applied according to the manufacturer's uh, recommendation as a such, both the warranty of the contractor and the manufacturer will be in effect at the completion of the job. Correct. And, and if I can add to that, it's, it's very important um, that, that you're obtaining the documents that are providing that, whether it be from the manufacturer or wherever the warranty is coming from. It's making sure that you have those documents and, and also making sure that you're scanning them. Uh, I know it sounds you know ridiculous to say that nowadays, but you know, having those documents is, is, are very important because if you don't have those documents, later it can be a challenge to, to try to get the, the warranties uh, done or, or I should say uh, whatever warranties need to be applied, getting them applied. Um, so, so we're getting here to the top of the hour. Um, I wanted to personally thank you, Misha, for, for doing the webinar with us. It, it's always a pleasure having you on. Um, I know that there's certain questions that, that we weren't able to get to, but I do want to be respectful of board member and manager's time. We did say the webinar would be within an hour. Um, I wanted to thank Stephanie from your team um, for making the webinar happen. I wanted to thank Ashley uh, as well from our team. Are there any closing remarks that you would like to provide to our board members and managers that are uh, on the call? I'm, I'm not going to do closing remarks. I, I asked you to scroll through the, through the unanswered questions, so I'm going to use one minute to answer. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, uh, a rapid fire, a couple of them. Uh, Russell, cathodic protection stops but doesn't reverse uh, uh, ru uh, corrosion. So uh, for specialized application, it is a good idea. Uh, I saw it proposed several times in condominiums, but uh, not often or not in my experience recently implemented. So cathodic, cathodic uh, uh, protection is essentially applying uh, uh, um, electrical uh, um, surface fields to steel in order to prevent further corrosion, but it doesn't reverse it. So if it is bad, you can just keep it bad, just make it not go worse. So uh, uh, if it is to the point where you would want to consider it for preserving it in the future, it is kind of an expensive proposition. Uh, the other question was, uh, what paint do you recommend for finish? The, 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 I, I'm an engineer, so I don't have favorites, but uh, uh, BASF has a product that is outstanding, uh, that is of course uh, uh, quite costly, but has in the field proven quite good. There is other products from other manufacturers that are equally good, which are national manufacturers. Um, so, the gradient of how better BSF is versus the other one uh, versus the increase in price is something that you may want to consider. 
and then time of year to paint not during wait, not during great season uh, uh, because it's not really the rain that is bothersome it's the wind that goes with it and uh, for safety purposes you cannot swing a uh, building past certain wind exposure so uh, hurricane season slash rain season rain season is okay hurricane season be careful yep. uh, we actually have projects that started during hurricane season because people say well there was no hurricane for three years so <laughs> There, as far as atmospheric thing, sun, no sun, rain, no rain, pain doesn't care. Um, and, and if I can kind of add that one as a rapid fire as well, as in your negotiation uh, negotiations uh, with your contractor is make sure that you understand what the demobilization cost is going to be and what it's going to look like um, should a hurricane hit, um, because you can be surprised with additional expenses because they are going to need to remove swing stages. They are going to need to remove certain items. Uh, so make sure that you understand what that cost looks like so you could squeeze it into your budget if you're doing it during hurricane season. And my, my closing, listen, my closing statement is very simple. It doesn't have to be us, but be sure to get somebody to watch your back. And a quality engineer is well worth its uh, uh, fees. Uh, we see it over and over again, not only by being that engineer, thankfully, but a lot of time by getting to litigations where all of the problem caused by a not so great engineer ended up costing um, not only money, but delay and, and heartache uh, as a result of it. So be careful, that's all. Excellent. Um, so for all, of those, for all of those here, we had some people asking, how could we see this video again? Um, how could we reach Misha, Misha's firm? How can we reach Affinity's firm? Um, here I'm sharing our screen. You have our contact information. Also, for those of you with your cell phone, feel free to scan this QR code. It'll send you directly to our YouTube page. We have videos coming out every Tuesday, so make sure you subscribe to Affinity's channel. We'll be posting this video within the next day or two. Um, so if you want to go back and share it with your board members uh, and, and be able to show them the information that you gained. Um, from our behalf, I want to thank again Misha, his team, my team for putting this together. I also more importantly want to thank all the board members and all the managers that are here today. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to gain a little bit more knowledge, get a better understanding of how to manage your communities, how to better lead uh, your communities as well. So I wanted to applaud you uh, for that. Uh, thank you all again for being here in today's webinar. Uh, we look forward to having you at our next one. And thank you again, Misha. Appreciate everything you and M2E do. Rafael, thank you so very much for having us. It's a pleasure like always. Have a great thank day, you. everybody. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay safe.